Good morning, everyone in Europe. Good afternoon in China and wherever you are in Asia. Uh, thanks for joining us today. I'm Lada Carayon, the founder of China Connect, chinaconnectforum.com. We're a platform and connecting Western marketers with China's digital ecosystem since 2011 in Paris and Shanghai and helping them make a presence on the Chinese web and connect with the Chinese globally. So today, as half of humanity is on lockdown because of the COVID-19 sanitary crisis, we felt even more necessary to keep on connecting, being helpful and useful while sharing fruitful conversations to prepare the past to recovery. And of course, what better topic to launch the series than healthcare? So just before we start, I want first to share some guidelines. Uh, you can ask questions uh, just on the Q&A tab, just below your screen. Annie Nanette, who is our tech support, will be in the chat room, so she'll manage and if you need any help. Okay, now, uh, let me introduce our three fantastic guests today. Uh, Sebastian Godin, whose career has been dedicated to healthcare since taking management position at Sanofi in China in 2011. Later on, he founded the Care Voice, a Shanghai-based startup to make health insurance more human, recognized as a leading Asian health insure tech. He co-founded Startup Care, a related insure tech dedicated to insurance and benefits for startups and SMEs. Welcome, Sebastian. Martin is a physician with over 20 years of healthcare experience spanning clinical practice, hospital management, and healthcare IT. In 2012, Dr. Shen co-founded Xinhen, Trusted Doctors, a mobile health startup with recently merged with Tencent Doctor Work to form Tencent Trusted Doctors, which has become actually China's largest integrated digital online and offline model of healthcare network. Welcome, Martin. Thank you. And Xavier Verri was appointed as CEO of AXA China in June 2018 and serves as the chairman of AXA Tianping on the 21st of January 2019. His role in China includes um, oversight of AXA's Chinese companies, both fully owned and joint ventures in PNC, health and life insurance, as well as strategic partnerships and corporate development. Welcome, Xavier. Thank you, Laura. So now, before we dig into the market dynamics, uh, Martin, as a long-time insider, can you please tell us about the healthcare China context? I mean, what structured the healthcare market journey so far in China? Okay, thank you, Laura. Look, it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, I think when we talk about the journey to digital healthcare, it might help to give some initial context to where healthcare is in China and where we're going. So I think we've got an initial slide we can perhaps put up. Um, I think the key thing we look, when we look at China is a lot of people talk about uh, micro reform and things that are happening in the China market. But I think we need to take one step back and look at health in the overall context of what's happening here. And the key theme is that we're undertaking the greatest transformational shift anywhere in healthcare in the world today. And that is a transition to universal healthcare. So what you're seeing here in China, and this is underlying the journey to digital healthcare, is the emergence of universal healthcare in the public sector and in the private sector, the opening up of a, uh, you might say, a new generation of healthcare providers. So since 2008, the government has done everything around revolving, moving China towards very much similar to the European NHS, Australian uh, type healthcare system. Putting in infrastructure, putting in a payer system, now implementing a, a GP allocated to every resident, centralized drug purchasing. And if we look at coronavirus, COVID-19, Having done all of that, one of the first things they implemented was a guarantee. Everybody had free healthcare in China for COVID-19. And simple things like that really helped the approach that China took in public healthcare. And then in the private healthcare sector, what they're encouraging the emergence of a new generation of players. And I think in the 20th century, we really saw people build clinics, hospitals, et cetera. But this is where we're seeing a new approach. If you could start from the beginning, from a clean slate, what would you do? There are many people using a digital approach to healthcare, ourselves, including Ping An, Good Doctor. And there are people also building hospitals. And so later on, I'd like to share more about how we see an integrated approach being the way forward to create a sustainable healthcare system in 21st century, which is really leveraging digital 
as well as working together with insurers and insure tech players together. Uh, Sebastian and Savia will share more of that later. So back to you, Laura. Yeah, thanks very much, Martin. Uh, very interesting. Uh, Xavier, uh, as Martin just showed, uh, China just went through an amazing digital pass, I mean, this past decade. Uh, can you map a bit more in detail the air scale market? Sure. Thank you very much, Laura. So as we can see from the next slide on the deck, uh, the health tech market in the APAC region has been for several years and remains the second largest healthcare tech in the world, market in the world, behind the USA, and it's mainly driven by China. What is fascinating about China is not just the size of the healthcare market, but how quickly it has evolved in the past decades. In 10 years, healthcare went from inexistent to a trendy wellness support, and finally to a critical tool in the individual management of health, of health wellness, and disease. The Chinese government has launched uh, the health reform in 2009 with among key objectives to provide universal healthcare access and treatment for all China by 2020. In China, public hospitals are considered the most important health facility. The aim of hospitals reform is to maintain the social well welfare nature of the public hospital, but also to encourage pr private parties to invest in medical services and to cooperate with public sector. During the last decade, the government and the private sector has heavily invested in the healthcare infrastructure, optimizing the public hospital's capabilities, tripling the number of private hospitals, and multiplying the number of lighter medical centers across the country. If we move to the next slide, we realize that by 2020, there were little health tech to speak, to speak of, as we can see here. Health is a prerogative of the public domain. In 2011, Chinese government allows medical practitioners, doctors and nurses, to conduct multi-site practices. This will pave the way towards digital health development. Between 2010 and 2014, the quick rise in adoption and use of mobile internet created a sharp rise in online communities around wellness and later health. And those communities are structured around and as resources of information. The emergence of the IoT, step counters, smart scales, etc., accelerated the adoption of health tech devices by these communities to leverage those technologies as an engagement tool with the community, community members. So basically, we see both an increased interest in health and wellness, and tools being created to monitor, find information, and unite communities. If we move to the next slide, we realize that 2015 is the first pivotal year for health tech. By early 2015, most of the platform, most of the key platform that are in use today were created. Trusted Doctor, Ping and Good Doctors, and so on. Internet moves from being a source of peer-to-peer -peer information to being a legitimate and integral part of health management. First, of course, with telemedicine providers, such as Pingan, Good Doctor, or Ali Health. At first, these platforms were only allowed to provide advice, not to prescribe. But then we see the emergence of professionalization of wellness and genomics. For example, the largest genomics data bank, the BGI, Beijing Genomic Institute, began to actively participate in the field of personalized medicine through a global network of collaborators. Then 2018 sees an acceleration with the regulators issuing specific supportive policies to boost the emergence of internet hospitals, e-hospitals, providing end-to-end -end online medical services from consultation to prescription, specifically for chronic disease management. According to the National Health Commission, there were 158 such e-hospitals as of April 2019. All these innovations led to a plethora of resources for individuals, but they remain fragmented and patient and individually driven. 
there is no consolidated view of the health of an individual. And the information individuals can have remains highly biased based on individual choices and apps and individual beliefs and interests. That leads us to the next slide, which is 2020 and beyond. Now is the next turning point in the health tech revolution in China. We witness significant efforts to create true healthcare tech ecosystem, connecting the different resources, integrating them to present individuals and their healthcare providers with a complete holistic picture of their health and wellness. This includes information and prevention, leveraging social media, key platforms, trusted networks of doctors and hospitals apps, but then it includes also pharmacy and medicines with the e-hospitals I was mentioning to have access to the pharmacy licenses and be able to prescribe and deliver medicine conveniently. Then it includes patient data, how to basically make sure that China through the introduction of the electronic health records allow a better transfer and sharing of the health information. And finally, a one-stop shop for medical consultation. If we move to the next slide. This is basically where we understand that the next evolution is clearly around the full integration of all those items to move from a physical interaction with our, with our doctors and so on to much more of an online to offline interaction with the entire healthcare ecosystem. With that, I leave the floor to you, uh, Laura. Thanks very much. Um, thanks very much, Javid. So, Sebastian, uh, as a health tech entrepreneur uh, into China since 2011, uh, you've witnessed and you've embraced actually the, the country's fast digitization. So, uh, what do you see are the key takeaways and what's your perspective actually on the market's past decade? Yes, yeah, thanks, Laura. Um, I think that we had already a very good uh, uh, retrospective and, and key, uh, key players. I would add two, two complementary perspectives. Uh, first one is, you know, what could have been driving this transformation of healthcare and the uptake of digital uh, in China? And if you look at the, at the slide, um, actually, you, you can compare the level of satisfaction uh, of people in China uh, versus any other major economies. And you can see that China is the least satisfaction for, for its healthcare. It was a couple of years ago, but that reflects the fact that you had strong pain points in this market to help people just to access healthcare. The main healthcare was public, public hospital, with a very challenging access uh, to doctors and to have decent experience. So there were a strong need for having an alternative way to access healthcare. And I think that's, that's, a, that's a major driver. And any markets can, can think about the level of satisfaction and what can drive adoption. The second key uh, perspective is about who pays. So next slide. Um, you know, for, for having a large uh, development of digital healthcare, you need to have a payer. And you have to be honest and, and a bit provocative. Venture capital have paid a lot for the, for the, for the, for the growth of, uh, of, of digital health in China. And, um, you know, a winter came in that specific uh, area already in China in 2017, number of digital health had to uh, either shut down or pivot, and actually it was healthy because it, it forced all these digital health to figure out a uh, more sustainable way of monetization. monetization. Let's see what with the current uh, environment um, uh, will we, we, we'll drive further. But I think it's important to, uh, you know, to have in mind that China actually is, is, a, is a consumer's play with a mostly self-pay market. People have a universal coverage, but very limited uh, depths. So they have to pay for it. And actually what has been validated in terms of business model is related to e-commerce. All these platforms, all these services, most of the time end up by channeling product, health product medications as a way to monetize. So what, what could be the other ways that we've been observing and, and the medical providers could be, but actually so far was dominated by public hospital. What is very interesting is that there is a strong shift to private offering. You can see in this graph where it moved from one fourth of the hospital clinics to half of them with a huge development. And these fast private um, medical providers, you know, could be uh, also fueling part of the investment, even though for now they have a low patient base. Uh, and the last component is uh, insurance. 
And actually, there's been a, a, also a significant booming of, of private health insurance to compensate the self-pay of people. And that was enabled through digitization. So here, there's been mostly around low-tier affordable products, but we see more and more uh, going towards a mid hand to cover private medical services, uh, which is a very interesting dynamic. And also employers very, very actively driving the, the adoption of health insurance as a retention and productivity tool for staff. So with that, I think we we'll touch more about this digital insurance offering because it has been, I think, a key driver also of, of the development of health insurance and, and servicing a way to make maybe digital healthcare more sustainable. Well, I guess, Xavier, uh, thanks very much, Sebastian. Um, Xavier, what about uh, AXA and AXA Labs? Uh, as a leading global private insurer uh, established for more than 20 years in China, uh, what, what do you particularly highlight? So thank, thank you very much for this question, Laura. And, and we can, uh, you can move to the next slide. But um, AXA has been present in China for more than 20 years. And one of the things we've been working hardest on is to understand the Chinese customers, to understand the Chinese customers, uh, who they are, what they need, and who they need us to be for them. Uh, in the last decade, with the burgeoning economy, we see the dramatic demographic changes in China. Rising incomes, better education, shifting urban landscapes, generation change, and we've witnessed the explosive growth of the emerging upper middle class. In 2012, the upper middle class accounted for just 14% of the Chinese urban household. By 2022, this proportion will have jumped to 54%, and it will be accounting for 56% of the urban private consumption. Private healthcare expenditure by this upper middle class will grow at a rate which is estimated to be more than 11% annually over the next two decades. It gives the importance of the healthcare to Chinese families, the rapidly aging population, and the challenges facing the public healthcare system. The Chinese government has launched now the Healthcare China 2030 blueprint, which sets goals to enable everyone to be involved in health on a nationwide level. As we are deeply anchored into China, AXA is investing heavily uh, in leveraging our global resources and expertise in health to empower Chinese customers to live a better and healthier life. And this is clearly what we are trying to achieve through, integrated with, through integrating all our solutions with the entire ecosystem of the healthcare in China. Thanks very much, Tabi. Um, well, as we've just seen, I mean, the market seems really on steroids. I mean, that's, uh, and it's a, a major trend. One of the major trend, uh, trends, sorry, on the market is the platformization of the internet. Um, so the, the healthcare industry is obviously a concern as well. Martin, uh, you're a pioneer actually of uh, digital health. Uh, Tencent is a leader of the Chinese internet. Uh, can you please tell us? Uh, what is Tencent Trusted Doctors, uh, which has become actually in a few years uh, China's largest integrated uh, digital online and offline model for healthcare networks? Yeah, thank you, Laura. Um, yeah, if we could just open up the slides, I think we just heard a lot about the growth that's happening in this market, as well as the transformation of digital, as well as um, insurance players really coming in and saying, how can we build this market? So this question is, who's going to provide the care? We've got people willing to pay, we've got people who need it, but really on the supply side, we have a problem in China. So I just quickly want to reinforce a concept I introduced earlier. How do you provide healthcare in the 21st century? So let's say traditional healthcare players are all offline. Now we're seeing Pian, Good Doctor, We Doctor, Hao Daifu, ourselves, TTD, in this digital healthcare space. But the problem is digital healthcare, at the end of the day, is care via a mobile phone or PC. I've never seen a phone at the end of the day perform surgery. So where does healthcare need to go in the future? I think this is where our particular view on digital healthcare is a little bit different. We believe that an integrated approach to healthcare is the way forward of the 21st century. Healthcare can be moved online. Can we move from 100% offline care to maybe 80, 60, 40% care? And online care move to 20, 40, 60, 80% of care and create a sustainable healthcare system. So on the next slide, you can really see as TTD, we're clear positioning as Tencent Strategic Healthcare Service Platform, a one-stop platform for our patients. From healthcare management, prevention, immunization, GP care, through to surgery, 
We're the leading partner, 450,000 physicians across China. And we really put technology at the core of everything we do. And next slide. So if you look at uh, where we've come from, uh, we were formed actually in 2018. So a very new company through the merger of two companies. And in a very rapid time, we've now become the largest integrated healthcare service provider. So we actually cover online internet healthcare services, e-pharma, 28 minute delivery of drugs, 450,000 specialists online, all the way down to uh, appliance, health kiosk care, GP clinics, specialist clinics, all the way through to surgical centers. We've done everything from millions of consultations online, all the way through to tens of thousands of operations offline. And today we have 107 facilities across China. So on the next slide, just a quick cap on where we are offline. We currently, currently cover 12 cities, 107 sites. We have clinics extending from GP clinics through to ASCs. We have all of the corporate clinics across Tencent, Dow Jones, uh, Mars, a number of corporate clinics now it's going up to 26. Today, we actually just announced uh, the integration of pediatric services that were actually on Savia's slide earlier. Uh, and we've seen over 3 million patients in our offline clinic. And on the next slide, just getting a, a bit of a feel for our network. You can see our amateur care really wanting to provide international level care, but a local price. So our full blood count CBC is priced at roughly around three euros. Uh, next slide is our specialist clinics. So we have dental clinics. We have about 28 dental clinics at the moment. Oh, sorry. Surgical clinics. We have 10 plus and several in construction right now uh, with full uh, lamella airflow surgical centers. We're the largest uh, surgical center provider in China today as well. And on the next slide, uh, as I mentioned, 20 plus, 28 uh, dental clinics. Uh, we're opening up 10 eye clinics to this year as well, uh, extending across a number of multiple specialties. And then online on the next slide, you can see really our span and our depth. So with 450,000 uh, physicians online, we're really helping our users take, encounter and deal with their last minute problems. So integrated medication, uh, hospital license, um, monthly drug trade volume, or very large numbers. But I think the next slide really shows, I think what people wanna hear in this talk today, which is what happened over COVID-19. Uh, this actually happened over the span of uh, three weeks. So this was the volume via Tencent's WeChat um, portal. And we had fairly large volume to begin with. And literally over the span of two weeks, it didn't do a J curve, it did an L. <laughs> uh, and so it really, there's been a huge change with what COVID-19 has brought along. A change in the way the patients are seeking healthcare delivery, uh, a change in the way the physicians are providing care, it's really been an impetus for change management across our whole organization. So later on, I'll also talk about some of the things we're doing with our doctors when we talk about the trends in the future. So uh, following up on the next slide, just some quick uh, coverage, uh, comments of time on some of the innovations that we're doing uh, in the digital healthcare space. So three main areas, one is in the physician private practice area. And on the next slide, you can see what we've really done is said, as physicians come out into private practice, is there a better way to, to to change the way that, that medicine's practiced. And so we're actually providing an integrated online, offline model for doctors where they have their actual literal office in their phone, managing their patients, following up pre, post consultation, medications, Chinese medicine, genetic testing. We integrate the whole value chain around our physicians to the point where they can even come in, see their patients, write their prescriptions, perform surgery and do follow up. Uh, and on the next slide, I think really within the space, we're partnering with over a hundred physician groups uh, and we're the largest in that space today. And then technology-driven healthcare, on the next slide, I can share with you four of the main drivers that we have currently already rolled out. We have a few more in the pipeline where we extend care, not through just our physical presence or online presence, but also through healthcare appliances. So our vending machines, our self-diagnostic uh, uh, appliances, which are now being rolled out quite rapidly, uh, including integrating the health kiosk concept as well as our future clinics. So we believe that our own physicians, both online and offline, um, don't need to be restricted by four walls. So we can actually take each of our specialists and actually project them into all of our clinics and even our special corporate clinics. So we can have a corporate clinic with a GP, but you can literally go in there and see a specialist at the same time. Uh, and that's something that digital has really changed as well as the option in China with 28 minute delivery of drugs, overnight career delivery, et cetera. Uh, and so just maybe we'll just quickly go through the next slides one after the other, just some pictures to share some of the things we're doing. So next slide. 
Uh, you can see some of our kiosks, the next slide, uh, the kiosk as well as some of the uh, appliances when you go in and get a, a full checkup prior to your clinic visit. Uh, here's some of the screens that you, you might be able to see. Uh, apologize for the speed. Uh, also the experience within the health kiosk and speaking to a physician via a video conference. Uh, next slide. So you can really picture the, the, the future and the way of providing healthcare. You can use digital as an embedded way of improving the delivery of private healthcare instead of going about the old way. So on the next slide. And then the last area is innovation around family medicine. So as we move towards a, a new way of delivering healthcare, we believe that family medicine will be an important part, but we realize that China is not there yet. So using a digital enabler, we really are bringing the family medicine role in its initial phases more as a guide for our patients in the way they navigate healthcare. And on the next slide, you see some of the things we're doing in this area today, and we're rolling this out quite rapidly in Shenzhen, uh, in one city, uh, where we also have over 50 sites offline. Uh, and here, really just helping patients navigate through to get the, the right answers that they want. And on the very last slide, to share with you our mission. Really, our goal is to leverage technology to provide high quality healthcare that's accessible and affordable to everyone. We're not in the business of high end healthcare for rich. And this is, I think, the greatest transformation of healthcare today. And this is why we say um, the market's growing. We have payers that want to come into the market but who can provide this care? And we think we are the model that provides this care. So thank you very much, Laura. Thanks, v very interesting, Martin. I mean, and actually with everything that's going on right now, I guess telemedicine and every one of you has, uh, has or will actually highlight it. It's just increasing, accelerating in a way that is amazing. Um, and lately when you come, when you're saying, you know, it doesn't concern the rich, I mean, I've seen the latest announcement with the uh, World Health Organization, this big project that you're having in, you know, making, I mean, health precisely and monitoring health accessible to, to as many as possible is it's really a, an interesting initiative. Um, so, yeah, back to you, actually. Well, uh, ICSA's global position is a from payer to partner. Uh, as a holistic health solution provider. Um, how did you at AXA uh, respond actually to this COVID-19 crisis, you know, and what does it mean next? Thank you, Laura. Um, so during the COVID-19 uh, crisis, and we've seen it, uh, the public hospital began also to provide online medical consultation to patients. The Chinese government has issued, in fact, health QR code to every Chinese citizen or resident in order to better prevent the outbreak and control the current epidemic situation. I have no doubt that the Chinese uh, government and the Chinese customers will keep on encouraging the investment in technology in the health sector and the health care. Uh, maybe you can put the, the, the slide backwards. Um, but basically, the, the point is, we definitely share uh, Martin's enthusiasm, uh, maybe next one, on the, uh, on the, um, the fact that um, COVID-19 is completely changing the way uh, the, the customers and the patients are approaching, in fact, healthcare. We've seen it through the big curve that Martin has shown us with the teleconsultation boom in the, in the, during the COVID-19 crisis. At AXA, and by the way, we, uh, we are partnering with uh, the Stanton Trusted Doctor to, to make sure that we can also offer that sort of uh, uh, services to our customers. But at AXA, we believe that our mission will evolve towards orchestrating curated services, bringing personalized proactive and progressive prevention and protection solutions to our customers across the continuum of care. So we, are, we aim at launching top innovative health products able to fill the protection and service gap for our target customers. And to do so, we partner with the Chinese uh, leading online health service providers such as Tencent Trusted Doctor, Shwedi, Wishur, and others. For us, the coronavirus is clearly it's an epidemic which is a turning point in being fully digital, not only in developing convenient channels for customers, but also to enable along the entire insurance value chain till the back end, including underwriting and claims management. What we are working on is clearly to give access to our customers, to our medical uh, concierge, topic where basically we could integrate what Martin was, de was describing as the real integration of the online and the offline services. 
And I completely share uh, Martin's point on the fact that uh, we need to leverage the technology, we need to leverage uh, the, uh, the mobile technology and the enablement and the access to information, to solution that this is providing. But still, this uh, mobile phone, as mentioned by Martin, does not perform surgery. So we still need to orchestrate all the elements around prevention, cure, protection, and post-treatment that are necessary for a potential patient. And this orchestration of the curated services is definitely the next element we need to work on. And this is the purpose of our payer to partner strategy, which is a worldwide strategy that we started to develop at AXA three years ago, but for which we believe, and I am absolutely convinced, that here in China, we are clearly in a market where such a deployment uh, will be faster than anywhere else because it's really a market where we have the combination between a very uh, digital savvy population, the access to very, very modern and unprecedented tools available for the customers and the willingness from uh, the physical providers to integrate those solutions for the providing a better service to the customer. So I absolutely consider that here in China, we have the size of the population, we have the, the, we have the physical networks, but we also have the technological development that will help us to push very strongly uh, a payer-to-partner strategy, meaning uh, repositioning the insurer as uh, a trusted partner for uh, the prevention, the management of the issues, and the post-treatment uh, post management for any patient. Um, so this is clearly uh, our, our positioning at AXA worldwide, but more specifically here in China. Thanks very much, Xavier. Um, Sebastian, how did health insurance players respond to the, to the COVID-19 crisis for you? So, yeah, so I think uh, if, if you can, I have, I have wanted to, to also echo what Xavier has been uh, uh, talking about and give a, a broader perspective to multiple insurance players. And before the, the COVID response, I think what has been the underlying foundation for fast response, especially to, to, from health insurers. So if you can show the next slide. I think there have been several waves of, of, of digitalization of uh, health insurance uh, in China. And, and I echo Xavier in the sense that China is definitely leading the way uh, in that aspect. The, the first waves arrived like already four years ago where everybody, every insurer is starting to move mobile full speed, uh, but mostly around claim. And this has been also enabled a lot through a WeChat ecosystem to make it very easier for people to access uh, their mobile engagement. But some insurers like Ping and for instance, were really forcing people to go to native apps because of data uh, constraint and not necessarily sharing within Tencent. Um, second wave happened within the next two years and, and it's where we started to talk about like a customer digital healthcare journey. So how to start to support um, uh, insurance member around well-being, around medical. So for instance, Checkup. When you go to go do your checkup offline before being enrolling, how can you directly digitize the results of your checkup and integrate this into signing up directly for your insurance? No need to, you know, any paperwork it's directly linked from the checkup center. This is happening. Uh, obviously, step counting, mental health. This is type of service that are now deployed in single customer journey. And then when you face symptoms, how do you help people to figure out which doctor, getting an online consultation, booking, second medical opinion. So. The PDP and Health has been leading uh, in, in one of the early players in that space, but also a uh, player like AXA. We were very happy to start work operating with AXA uh, two, three years ago, already in this kind of, of customer digital healthcare zone. So, so what's next? What's coming next? I think it's really around addressing the gaps in terms of fragmented ecosystem, because you have still all these different services you want to bring to your customers, but they are all different single uh, digital players. And, and how you connect the dots, how you make sure that at the end, your customer have a unified uh, digital journey and how also you make it uh, personalized to him. So this comes from data integration and that we led also better customer understanding, better risk assessment of the customer. And we start definitely to see this happening uh, with some of payer and ultimately being able to bring more tailored and company value proposition, tailored to some specific population. So that's, I think, a first foundation on, on the digitalization of health insurance. The, the next slide, the next slide is more around the distribution, which is another big aspect of, of, of how you get access to the product. 
And I think what we've been observing in China is already quite impressive in terms of, of disruption of the distribution. Um, you know, first, I think there is already a massive activity around online brokers, so to sell insurance, but now to really continue to expand faster, to acquire offline resources. Uh, and, and how it's like they, they figure out some offline communities, businesses that can be their new monetizations because they can start to give access to uh, medical insurance. It's also very interesting, you know, the traditional brokers that were offline or even just agent of insurers have been poached or acquired by these online brokers so that they have a, a broader offline resources. Many times in China, you, you see online brokers, but actually it's all, all online players, but it's a lot about offline resources that help you to capture offline the customer. And then you have start to have also uh, new players that are creating from scratch new products um, and, and they become alternative to traditional insurer, traditional distribution model. So it could be digital broker that start to get capability and not only sell, but have the ability to design product and also to operate part of the insurance business or insurtech players like us who are also getting this ability to design and operate uh, and, and, and bring the product to the relevant audience. So that's quite a, a, a new trend that happened in the market. And last one on distribution is around reinsurance. You know, in this world, reinsurance usually are the, 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 the most far from the customers. But in China, they are really leapfrogging to go in the front. As a result of what have been already very well developed in terms of digitalization of health insurance, their response to COVID-19 have been quite effective. Actually, we did a survey uh, to 50 insurance professionals at the time of the outbreak, like two months ago. And, um, you know, it was a way to better understand how they would go through the crisis, how they would anticipate the impact on sales. And, 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 and a few months later, actually, there have been a positive sales impact that came much faster than anticipated. I think initially they were estimating some downside in sales uh, for the first three months. Uh, but actually it turned out very quickly into strong growth, especially for lower tier product, more affordable, special product for, for COVID-19, plus a 20% additional growth. The main issue is around uh, sales team uh, that have been working remotely and not being able to engage with customers. As of now, 50% of sales team have resumed, uh, but still the access to customers is, is challenged. So that was more about how they, the insurers perceived and the impact on sales. But also they took some very quickly some actions. Within the first two, three weeks after the outbreak, um, players, digital players, and also enabling traditional insurers have been able to take action, launching very quickly new products, digital insurance products specifically for COVID-19 for individuals and, and down to medical professionals with like, for instance, what did AXA in this field, but also very specific digital services that they could embed in their ecosystems with uh, some partners, symptom checker, online consultation, specialized screening and treatment center directory, as we've been supporting with some of these insurers. Uh, in the meantime, still some issues uh, have been um, expressed by insurers in this period, and especially around tech partnership, the ability to find technology partners that can help for faster product innovation, uh, online product delivery, uh, making all the customer experience fully digitized for sales down to servicing customers. And this is the area uh, where, where there is further need for enhancement, as well as identify and validate new sales channels because the, the, the salespeople, the offline agent broker are not there. So how do you can still engage and sell online with customers? I wanted to ask each of you, um, uh, obviously, I mean, there's uh, an amazing dynamic. Uh, this platformization is obviously very core cool to the market, but it's very interesting to see the coexistence of businesses on and offline business, private and public. Um, I'd like to ask, yes, each of you, what do you see as the key drivers, the main drivers of the future of the market? You know, what is going to shape, I mean, the, the, the healthcare market in the, in the next few years or the decade to come? Martin, maybe. Okay, um, if we could just put up uh, one quick slide. I think there are three things that are gonna drive the, the trends in healthcare. So uh, universal healthcare, new models of healthcare delivery and private insurance. So universal healthcare, we've already spoken. Private insurance, Salvia will speak to you better than I can. I think new models of healthcare delivery are the real driver. And you see some of the um, illustrations that we have there. We're really moving out on a new fast pass concept in our, in our clinical delivery model, including online consultation, come into the clinic for less than two minutes to get your blood taken, online medications, reporting, follow up online, online models of healthcare delivery also change the way we practice medicine. So during this period, a number of things have come out like CRP testing from home. Um, 
This is uh, from some of our European colleagues. These are coronavirus test strips. So uh, just a pin prick and you can uh, test yourself, but this is antibody IgG, IgM testing. So it's not PCR. But a whole new generation of things that are coming out where we can um, enable better delivery of digital healthcare. I think that's one of the key trends we're seeing now. Um, back to you. Thank you very much. What about you, Xavier? So thank you, Laura. I, I would like to mention perhaps four, um, four trends. The first one is clearly artificial intelligence will continue to be the driving force behind the innovation towards personal, personalized health and medical solutions. That's clear. The second part is lifestyle management is gaining further traction to encourage people and to help people stay healthy. And this is clear, it's strong here in China in the Asian world. It's gonna come to the uh, Western world as well, uh, much more strongly than what we expect, I think. The third element is, real, is really about uh, mental health, rising need in mental health care and the large treatment gap. This is specifically true, I think, in Asia, um, in China. And we've seen through the COVID-19 that uh, this is putting also a lot of stress and a lot of pressure on the people. And uh, having mental health care or mental support uh, is something that needs to be deployed further in, in our countries. And the fourth one, is um, what I would call home sweet home as a new hospital for chronic, critical, and elderly care management. The integration of artificial intelligence, the wearable devices, the open data sources, and so on, will allow people to stay at home, but still be treated for chronic condition, critical, uh, critical conditions, uh, elderly care, and so on. And again, uh, coronavirus, COVID-19 crisis is showing us that um, whatever can be accessed through your own home is really the next, the future trend that people will want to see. Because we will still always need to visit a practitioner or to go to a, a healthcare center for receiving a specific treatment. But as much as we can deport part of that from, well, from the hospital, from the clinic back to home, then this will be clearly, I think, a, a, a very important trend for the future. And we have a role to play there as a private insurance uh, player. So work from home, health from home, everything from home. Obviously, it's going to be a safe place and that's super trendy for sure. Sebastian, to give your take on what you see as the future of the market. So in terms of future trends, um, I would pick up two. I think uh, one, is I think I briefly touched upon earlier on in the presentation, but it's around this concept of tailored health plan for specific population. How can um, insurance product uh, approach very similarly, you know, a sport enthusiast person, a white collar single woman, uh, kids or pregnant women, their well-being, their uh, medical needs are different. Their medical risk is different. So the ability to uh, design insurance product that understand these different risks and bring health services that are relevant to this population and driving also more prevention and general behavior is something that it starts and I think will be a more prevailing uh, uh, trend across, uh, across markets. Uh, a second trend, and to some extent as a link with this tailored health plan is what we can call tech-enabled smart channels. You know, traditional way of selling insurance have been through agents, through brokers offline. Obviously we see some online sales, but what is very interesting is now the opportunity to uncover new sales channel, looking at uh, businesses, online communities, where you have uh, a very defined population where it's relevant to engage with them around health and to bring some services around health and also insurance. Uh, and this should be taken in. So let's say for instance, uh, gym centers, if you want to, uh, target specifically people who are sport enthusiasts. Gym centers can be a way where also through technology, you can understand who are the customers in these gym centers, what their profile, how they are active they are, and engaging them directly after maybe coming to the gym or before in where parenting and introducing new products. Um, we work is another example or co-working space where you have specific population that have very specific needs around health benefits. How, uh, you know, tap into these uh, resources and so on and so forth with different population where you can really create now tech enable smart channels. Thank you. Well, we, we're gonna thank all of you and uh, 
there are quite some questions. Uh, so I believe, I mean, that's uh, the, the best thing that we can do now is uh, see, um, you know, who's as, asked questions. So we've got a few. Uh, and let me pick uh, some of them. Um, Olivier Milcon, he's still there, so he's asking in China, how are doctors engaged with those tech innovations? In Europe and mostly France, they are more uh, of a bottleneck than and an accelerator. So, um, what, I mean, who would want to, to take that question actually? you know about obviously maybe europe and france flagging a little bit behind um so that's the question of olivier okay well maybe as a as a doctor as well as managing clinics i'll answer that question so i think uh, in china we have the same problems in europe uh, doctors are doctors and uh, adopt technology quite slowly so what we saw previously was the uh, we saw a trend where we had doctors that were just employed to do online work and that's the pian hot or doctor model and we had also a lot of offers of doctors like this as well, as well as the offline doctors who traditionally don't use technology that much. But what we've discovered over the last month is that people have embraced the future. I no longer need to have to push our doctors online. In fact, we use this opportunity to make basically every day during COVID-19, we were changing the way we practice and I've moved all of our doctors online. Everybody's digital enabled, everybody's doing consultations online. And so it's probably been from that perspective, uh, a huge driver in the way we're practicing um, and, and driving our business model. I'm not saying that COVID-19 is a good thing, but from a digital transformation side, um, sometimes you rely on these external drivers to change transformational shift. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, more, point, more to the point, if you don't use a digital platform, then you probably don't have a job tomorrow because there is no work offline. <laughs> Because it's going to be pretty much the trend uh, <laughs> everywhere else. Um, there's a question from Philip, Philip Einstein, um, asking is, a, uh, is temperature measure uh, in public spaces a must in China yet? Uh, well, obviously it's accelerated with the COVID crisis, uh, but is it yet something uh, a must? I guess maybe Martin, you could ask as well, unless Xavier, I guess you, you both have the, the answer. Uh, yes, I mean, China started this at the very start, probably before everybody else. You measure your temperature everywhere, the bottom of your building, the front of your building, <laughs> anytime you walk in and out of anywhere. And let me just see if I can show people a screenshot. Again, every country has its own system. But recently, China's now moved to um, an integrated technology approach to how we do screening. So this is a barcode that everybody has. You can see I'm green. So now in China, I can actually travel on a plane and fly and move around without being quarantined. Now, mm -hmm. the, the other interpretation of this is there is some invasion of privacy. So they're using big data AI to track where you've been, every single location you've been, and to be able to do a risk analysis. But way back in January when this started, basically within a week, we were all able to search our own flight, train, public spaces, and you could see if on that day there were any other COVID-19 patients in the same location. So contact tracing was fully digitalized. Um, mm -hmm. So people, I guess it's an approach to look at the greater good. Um, again, I know this is a European audience, so different systems, different approaches. Well, yeah, but it, it's true. Thanks very much for, for your answer, Mark. I think, well, that's also becoming of a, a topic, an issue everywhere, uh, this uh, contact tracing. Uh, and well, then... I think it was great. We could just look, search for a flight number on a certain day and see whether there was another patient who had COVID-19. I think that's a good thing. That way you can self-isolate yourself and we can stop the spread. There's a question from Jean-Francois. The concern being dealt with, if at all. I mean, that's obviously kind of a question that, you know, in between Europe and the, the trend that is happening in China and that is actually coming to us as well because it's, it's being allowed. Um, so that's one of the concerns. And... How are body sensors coming into play for preventing uh, diagnosis, diagnostic help? Yeah, sorry. How are body sensors coming into play for preventing or, or diagnostic health? Does anyone want to, to answer this question? Maybe I'll leave it to my two colleagues or... 
Well, I, oh, oh. I guess, Martin, you are the most qualified to talk about that. Because <laughs> no. this, is part, this is part of your model. And this is why I love your model. I think um, we do a lot I of the, the remote sensing, sensing. From a physician's point of view, it's very limited use. The skin temperature is not a value. We actually had one pilot in Chengdu with the government where a select group of quarantined individuals had a 24-hour temperature model monitor on their actual person. And that was monitored 24 hours. So that was very interesting. That was live. That's not a trial. Um, so, yeah, a number of things like that are happening. And you've heard other stories in China where they put a buzzer on the door so that you can't open your door. Quarantine is quite well enforced here. <laughs> There's a question I actually I, I think everyone can, can answer from Michael uh, because it's been something we've, me, we've seen in China for a couple of years already. It's not from yesterday. Uh, Martin, I see you reference clinic-based diagnostics that almost look like a walk-in booth. Do you think this is how private healthcare will expand to tier two cities in China. I think it did already massively a couple of years ago for just telephone, people entered the booth and they were actually, uh, uh, you know, having that first advice in, instead of precisely going to hospital and fill up hospitals. Because I come from a clinical point of view, I still believe in the value of the doctor. So my technology friends will say it will be replaced by a, a kiosk or a phone. I think there's a couple of things that in that last step that aren't there, including, some of these things have been developed today, like these diagnostic kits. I mean, when we start having this as well, and then we have a better drug delivery and a better virtual capability to diagnose, I think we can get there. But I don't think we're there yet. So I think the kiosks are more to assist the way we provide care, to do initial triage, reduce unnecessary clinic visits, but we still need a mix of both. But in this model, in one city, I could have 10 to 15 clinics and not need 500 clinics. If, if I may jump in uh, from, uh, from my perspective, I think that if we want to understand China, we need to look at the size and the scale. And China, it's all about size and scale. It's all about the size of a continent and the scale of 1.4 billion people that need to get access to a lot of things. Here we talk about healthcare, but it's true for anything. And the key strategy and the key element is really how do we make sure to provide everybody in this country, wherever they are, with access to whatever is required. And here we are talking again about healthcare. But the consequence is that the, the problematics, the issues that have to be addressed are directly the consequence of the scale and the size. The ability to reach each and every place in this country the ability to reach each and every person, whether they are literate or not, whether they are rich or poor, whether they are in the middle class or not. And in that front, digital enablement, but also kiosk and, and all what is about uh, allowing, in fact, a proximity, allowing development at an affordable cost of a service of proximity will be put forward and will be a success in this country. Because again, if we really want to understand what happens in China, we always have to bear in mind the scale and the size and the necessity to provide the same access for everybody wherever they are. And I think that this is driving the digital development all across all value chains. And this will be a big push and a big necessity to keep on developing digital healthcare, including healthcare. Uh, thank you very much, Xavier. I think, uh, well, actually, it answers uh, one of the last questions we have, and we, we'll pick another one uh, for Sebastian, but uh, there's a question from Stan Vendier. Prevention was mentioned in some speeches. We know that prevention is more difficult to get people to pay for. Do you think behaviors, patients, attitudes will change thanks to digital tools, apps, and devices? Obviously, I mean, the pace of adoption in China is there. As long as you've got service and you bring conveniency, there's quick adoption. So I guess that, that would be your answer uh, as well. Well, on, on the prevention, it's a, it's a very good question because it's true that uh, it's difficult to monetize prevention. This is specifically true, in fact, in the West, in the Western world. In the Eastern world, it's a, perhaps a little bit different in terms of cultural perspective. That being said, uh, what we see in China is that the, the people, people are getting connected through communities, communities of interest, communities of uh, needs, 
and so on and so forth. And they are ready to contribute with each other and they are willing to uh, receive information, receive uh, devices, uh, receive advices, receive whatever it is, and they are still ready to accept, in fact, uh, to pay a little bit out of that, provided that provided the solution that they receive brings an added value to the people. So for me, the prevention uh, needs to be part of the overall equation. It cannot be a prevention and it cannot be about how do we monetize only prevention. It's about how do we make sure that prevention is an integral part of the overall experience that we are providing to the customers and how do we make sure that this prevention is meaningful individually for the people. And if we manage to do this, it's, the problem is not anymore to um, monetize the prevention. The, the, the answer is more, how do we provide a complete, uh, I would say, experience, which includes prevention, treatment, and post-treatment. Um, and how do we embed services which are valuable for the customers and which are services that the customer is ready to pay for even before he or she is experiencing a, a claim or, or she is experiencing a medical condition. So it's really, uh, we, if we just look at it in isolation, it's difficult. If we look at it as part of the solution, uh, and if we really integrate servicing behind that, we believe that there is clearly a way forward. Okay. Thank you very much. Add, add to that, I think, I think preventative care is very hard. Uh, let me be even more direct. I think Savia and insurance AXA is a key player in actually helping preventive mode work. The biggest problem in China and the world is nobody pays for preventive care. The bigger problem in China is nobody pays for what actually works, but they pay for everything that doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> so there is a huge market for healthcare products in China that um, I, I can't say they don't work, but has limited um, scientific backing. So the bigger thing is that we need to work as a private sector together with AXA as an insurer to provide a more comprehensive product to a consumer. And then in that respect, it's the payer and the provider who are wanting to spend more effort on prevention. That's the model anywhere in the world, whether it be the NHS, universal healthcare models, HMO models. At the end of the day, um, it's really a cooperation of the, the provider and the payer to work on prevention. I think asking people to pay directly, especially in, C in China, you really don't understand China, People will pay for a PET CT scan and 20 um, cancer markers and, and a whole bunch of uh, thermal remedies. And in fact, they probably only did a very simple test and they might not even do a pap smear. So all the things they're meant to do, they don't necessarily do, but all the things they don't need to do are all done. Okay, thank you, Martin. Uh, well, I, I just wanted again to, to give the, the floor to uh, Sebastian, but I feel like we, we've lost it. Sebastian, if you're still there, can you, can you tell us? Because I think uh, there were you know, two, 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 two issues that you, you were very keen on raising, which were uh, regarding regulation constraints. Um, and when you were a, a foreign entrepreneur in China, there were you know, kind of attitudes and uh, preconceived ideas uh, that were remaining, and we wanted to hear you about that. But if you're not there, since we're almost uh, an hour in, uh, well, I just want to, to thank everybody, uh, Martin, Xavier, Sebastian, and Ina. Thanks very much uh, for uh, your contribution, for your time today. Thanks to all of you who have uh, followed us uh, since this morning. Um, just to tell you that the replay will be available. Uh, we had a question about it also downloading the, the deck of this presentation. It will be available, so you will receive it via email. Uh, and I will just, you know, switch uh, to tell you that we have a new rendezvous next Wednesday, same time, same, same day, same time, I would say. Uh, and it's going to be a panel session uh, on obviously APAX retail renovations. We'll go beyond China with heads of uh, amazing retailers like InSports and Sunto, which is part of the Finnish brand, you know, Finnish group um, Sports, and now belonging to Anta. Uh, so we'll have really a picture about the impact of this COVID uh, on, you know, on and offline activities. So it should be really a not to be missed rendezvous uh, next week. Um, so do not hesitate to share that with your network and register. 
In the meantime, uh, take care, all of you. Uh, we're not at the end of this journey. We don't know how long. Uh, well, in China, you've been through this for at least three months, and it's uh, slowing, going back to slowly uh, going back to normal. So we need to be patient. Uh, take care. Um, stay home if you can, or back to work actually in Asia or in China. And see you next week. Thanks very much.